guys ready for the word? Now, before we go any further, will you please help welcome Peru and all those watching online? Will you put your hands together for them? Praise God. We love you guys. All right, now, here's what we got going on. Real quick, I'm going to take about five minutes and bring everybody up to speed on where things are because this Sunday happens to be an important Sunday in the chronological time period of Abundant Life Church, and this is called our first in our best Sunday. That means everything that we take in with our tithe and offering goes directly towards what we call Heart for the House. Heart for the House is the program that we use to pay for buildings, building campaigns. It's how we did the Peru building, um, and it's how we'll do future campuses. So that's kind of how that works. So let me bring you up to speed first and foremost on Peru, because I'm speaking to them, and I want them to know what's happening at their facility. So we're going to get through the Easter uh, weekend uh, in Peru with three services, okay? But I'll be honest with you, this service in Peru is packed out. I guarantee you it's been packed out for months. And uh, both of those services in Peru, they're doing extremely well. The sanctuary seats about 300, it seats 300 people, and they're packed out, you know, pretty much both services pretty continually. So we need to make, isn't that good? Praise God, that's phenomenal. All right? So, uh, so what, what we're going to do is we want to expand that sanctuary. To do that, we got to take out some of the uh, classroom space that's actually overflow space for us. So we're going to be renovating that. We're not going to start that, though, till after Easter. We're going to get through the holiday season of Easter, and then this summer, when typically numbers kind of uh, come down a little bit, we're going to take and tear that building up and renovate some of that. Add on about 100, 120 seats to that sanctuary, so it should seat around 400 or so. And again, with the campus, you never want to make it so big that people get lost in it, but yet at the same time, you want people to feel comfortable coming to church, praise God. And you go, well, how do we know what comfortable is? Here's when you know it's comfortable. When you leave the room and it doesn't smell like breath. <laughs> <laughs> which we have some issues at Kokomo. Uh, so so that, that's kind of how we know that. So that's what's going on with the Peru campus, and, and that's what's going on. Now, let's talk about the Kokomo campus. Here's where we're at with the Kokomo building. The actual plans and all the architectural plans for the new facility are completely done, uh, actually submitted through the state, and honestly, back from the state. We literally, as of Thursday, uh, we were supposed to get permits, or we could apply for permits as soon as Friday, Friday or Monday or Tuesday of this week, okay? We already have a foundation permit so we can pour, but, but we're, we're wanting to get everything done. Now, that's that. Now, let me back the train up and, and explain how this works. So we started planning this building out three years ago, okay? Now, whenever I went to the builders, I said, hey, listen, we need a facility that's going to do these things. And in light of that, we want to spend $12 million, okay? I'll be honest with you. 12 million is hard to get for everything that we're wanting or needing. So what we, what we said is build it for 12 and we'll see what we end up with. Well, here's what happened. They came back, and I know, and you should know this too, if you say 12, they hear 15. <laughs> okay? So, so I know that. So we said 12 knowing that it might be 15. Now, this was three years ago when we set out on this path. Okay? Now our building, the same building we're building, has been built seven times by other churches that we love and fellowship with, and they're awesome, all right? Now, in light of that, that same building three years ago, just the steel, the steel for the building, cost $2.5 million, okay? Now, that same building, same building, is now $5.6 million, okay? So that's what we're seeing across the board. How many of y'all know that that's going on in our economy right now? So it's not really the most ideal time to build a facility. So here's where we stand. All the numbers are in, all the bids are in, and the way the, the building is shaking down right now, as of Thursday, it, all the numbers for everything. This is start to finish, and this was turnkey without FF&E, which is furnitures, fixtures, and equipment. Some of you thought I cussed. It, it's not a cuss word. <laughs> FF&E, all right? And then you have AVL, which is all the electronics that run the place, which that's around $2 million, all right? But excluding those things, the, the entire project is at 17.65. That's where it's at. So there's a $2.5 million gap of where we want to be and where the project is costing us, okay? So here's what happens at this point. And, and here's 
now we've been engaged over the last several uh, weeks, well, honestly, some of them from the beginning of the project over three years, with different financial institutions. So the dilemma becomes this. Do we want to put it on pause and close the gap with cash, all right? We have cash already, but to close that gap, that $2.5 million of, of, with cash. So if we waited a year, we could probably close that gap and be fine. Or, or you run into a situation of this. Do we go ahead and move forward with the idea of you could run into a situation where we take and wait a year, but inflation ends up biting you anyway, so the year you waited to save the $2 million got ate up with inflation anyway. All right, so, so there's this game that we're trying to play. Let me first and foremost tell you this. You ready? I do not need a building to do church. We've proven that we can do big church. We just add services, all right? And we just keep going, all right? So here's my heart. My heart is, here's what I want you to hear this week. Again, if you think I'm coming after your money, that's not what I'm here for. I told you, we will never ask for money or beg for money from the platform. We just, we don't run it. We believe we should just be good stewards of everything that God brings in here. Amen? Okay, so there's number one. Number two, let me explain this. I'm asking that you pray for us that we'll have discernment on do we go ahead and pull the trigger or we pause. And I'll be honest with you, I'm more conservative Believe it or not, I know people don't believe this, but I'm more conservative. I'm the guy that we want to make sure that we do it right, so I'd rather slow down than speed up. So if that means we wait a year, then we wait a year. It's no big deal to me, all right? So that's kind of where that is. So what I would ask for you to do is just to pray. Just to pray that we'll have discernment, that we can hear what God's saying, so we can make the right decision at the right time to do the right thing. Can I get a witness on that? Praise God, all right? So that's what I'm asking for you to do. So, all right, so that should bring you up. I'll tell you next week because I'm running out of time. I can take the whole time and talk about this, but I'm not going to. I want to get into the word. Next week, I'll tell you about the organizations that we blessed. All right? So let's pray. You ready? We got to pray. You ready? Are we praying? Pray. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're good. No, I'm just kidding. All right. For real, let's pray. Father, I thank you for each and every person. Pray that you bless them, touch them. And Lord, more than buildings, we want to focus on your word. We want your word to take root in our hearts. We want it to transform our lives for eternity. God, we love you. We thank you thank you. And we thank you, Lord, that we get to sit in here, listen, and hear your word. Lord, change us all, me included, change us all from the inside out. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name, everybody says amen. amen. All right, so now let's get in the word. Now, are you ready for the word? Yeah. All right, I'm ready for it. Praise God. So we've been in a series talking about who is God, okay? And this started with the idea of the red letter question series, people asking about the Trinity and who is God. So the first week we talked about God the Father. Second week we came back, talked about the Son. This week and last week we're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. He's my best friend. He is my best friend, and I'm so thrilled that I get to stand up here and tell you about my best friend called the Holy Spirit. Last week, we kind of laid the foundation with some of these principles that I, I wanted to make sure that you understood, that he is your helper. Does anybody need help? Come on, I know I need help, praise God. So I need the Holy Spirit working in my life. I am not that smart, I am not that good. Only by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit do things get better in my life, amen? Listen to this, he lives in us. Greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world. He lives on the inside of you, and he wants to be, and he is my friend. He wants to be your friend. Now, my purpose in this message is really to do what I did last week, and that is to break down walls in your heart that maybe you've developed because of either bad teaching, maybe no religious teaching, maybe bad religious teaching, maybe some bad experiences, whatever the case is. I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit is to be your friend. And this verse says it better probably than I can. It says it this way in 2 Corinthians 13. The amazing grace of the master Jesus Christ. There, there's Jesus. Look at this. The extravagant love of God. There's the Father. Look at this third one. And the intimate friendship of who? The Holy Spirit. That's what you want. You want the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully last week and along with this week, I'm developing an appetite on the inside of you. I'm wetting your taste buds. I'm slobbering thinking about it. Um, <laughs> If you sit on the front row, you'll get baptized in this service too. Um, but uh, <laughs> do it all at once, praise God. 
Uh, but, but the truth of the matter is, man, God really wants a relationship with you. Listen to this, everybody. Jesus did not come and die on a cross to make you religious. He came so you would have a relationship. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? Religion and religious people, well, they actually kind of twitch when I get around them. <laughs> I twitch too, but anyway. Uh, but, but, but Jesus didn't come to make us religious. He came that we might have life. And he wanted us to have a relationship with him. It's about a relationship. So in light of that, last week we kind of broke down who the Holy Spirit was as far as your friend. This week I want to talk to you about the gifts, the gifts, the gifts. Well, first, and, and I figured I'd lay the foundation with talking about the first gift and probably the most important gift, which is this right here. What do you think the most important gift in your life is? Salvation. Everybody say Salvation. Salvation. Now, obviously, the gift of life is a gift, praise God. But can I tell you, the gift of salvation is where it's all at, praise God. If, you, if you're on this planet and you don't make it to heaven, what good is any other gift? Okay? We want to get you to heaven. And here's what the Bible says about that gift. It says, for the wages of sin is? Yeah, we know that. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our That's right. The gift of God is eternal life. So there's the first and I would call the greatest gift. Now outside of that, what is the next most important gift when it comes to you living out this life that God has called you to live? I personally believe it is the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Here's what the Bible says about it. Ephesians 1, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The gospel of your what? Salvation in whom also having, help me out, Believe you were sealed. signed, sealed, delivered. I'm yours. Some of y'all need some Motown in you. But anyway, but, but, but here's the way it works. When you got saved, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. You were sealed. He's sealed on the inside of you. You're completely sealed with the Holy Spirit. He lives in the, inside of your spirit. He lives and dwells in there. And you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, I call this, this is me personally, I call this Holy Spirit hijacking, okay? Because can I tell you, when I gave my heart to Christ and got on fire for God, nobody told me, first of all, nobody told me that the Holy Spirit lived in me. Nobody told me that he was going to want to take over my life. Come on, can I get a witness? I didn't know that. And can I tell you, I'm so glad he did. I'm so glad he did. But he does. He wants to take over your life. Is it possible for Christians to believe on Jesus but have no relationship to the Holy Spirit? It is. Check this out. This is in the book of Acts. And this is Acts 19. Or, I'm sorry. This is Acts uh, 19. Here's what it says. It says, and it happened while Apollos was at where? Corinth. It says that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. We get the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians from these people. It says, in finding some disciples, he said to them. So let me ask you a question. The answer is yes. <laughs> Are they Christians? Yes. Yeah. This is Acts 19. This is 10 to 15 years after. I don't know exactly. I know Acts 10 is 10 years. So uh, it's more than 10 years after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. These are believers. These are believers. And they're called disciples. So we know they're believers. And, and Paul asked them this, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He says, so they said to him, we have not even so much as heard whether there was or is a Holy Spirit. So it's possible to be saved, go to church, be a disciple, but not have any relationship to the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you, that is robbing you of one of the greatest gifts that God has given you. That is the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. And can I tell you, he's awesome. You should know about him. And can I tell you, the truth is, though, most churches don't teach about him. They don't teach their people about him. They don't teach their people how to move and operate with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not dogging anybody. I'm just telling you, that was my experience. I don't know if that was yours, but that was my experience. And I just want you to know. If you're attending, if you're at Peru, if you're listening on the radio or TV or whatever the case might be, man, we want you to develop a strong relationship with the person who lives on the inside of you. He is the third person of the Godhead. He is not watered down. He is God Almighty, and he's taken residence in your body, praise God. 
Amen? I want you to develop that. I want you to develop that. All right? So in light of that, listen to this. The, uh, in Acts 2.38, it says this. It says, and it happened while, uh, I'm sorry, let me, let me back that up. You ready? How about this? Acts 2, 38 and 39 says, Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right? For the promise is to you, to your Why am I hitting this? I'm hitting this because there, there are people who believe that the Holy Spirit and the works of the Holy Spirit have passed away and they don't apply to today. But that's not what your Bible says. It's for you, it's for your children, and it's to all that are afar off, listen to the last part, as many as the Lord God will call. So as long as God is calling on people to be saved, born again, and have a relationship with him, can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is there for them. Can I, amen? Amen. So we want everybody to know this. This applies to everyone. There isn't anyone ever excluded. As a matter of fact, Jesus says it probably more emphatically than anybody. Here's what he says in Acts chapter 1. This is the beginning of the church. This is the last words of Jesus before he leaves to go to heaven. How many of you believe this is important? All right? Here's what, he, I mean, think about it. If you're leaving someone's presence, like Jesus, and he says, oh yeah, before you go, I want to let you know about this. How many of you know you should write that down? Okay, all right. Here's what he says. He says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And that's where we get the term baptism of the Holy Spirit, infilling of the Holy Spirit, whatever the case might be. And, and I'm just going to be very honest with you guys. In a Bible college format, I teach on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I teach it literally for three hours straight, and I usually do six to eight classes, which is a little over 24 hours of teaching. So do I expect you to hear everything I have if it takes me 24 hours and you expect me to do it in 35 minutes. Yeah, I expect you to know all that. No, here's my point. There's a lot of things that I'm probably not gonna hit on as we move through my message here, but I, but I want you to know this. I, hopefully I can lay a foundation for it, okay? For it to rest on. And if you have more questions, I would strongly encourage you to attend a Develop Your Faith class. I would strongly ask you to contact the office. We are going to be putting out and doing some discipleship training, teaching stuff on this stuff very soon. Uh, that's why we built a studio. But, but the reality is the Holy Spirit, he's here. He wants to fill you. He wants to fill you with overflowing so that you're moving in everything that he has for you. Can I get a witness on that part right there? All right? So what are the gifts? that the Holy Spirit has, okay? Jesus has gifts. Those are mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, all right? But the Holy Spirit, as a person, has gifts. Now, before I go anywhere, where does he live? Are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? Could I ever talk you out of it? Okay, praise God. Okay, so, so he lives on the inside of you. Let me just ask you a question. Did you get an arm? Or a leg, or did you get all of him? All of them. I'm just curious. Just curious. So here it is. Here's what the Bible says about these gifts. These are called gifts of the Holy Spirit. But the manifestation of the Spirit, in other words, the, the proof of the Spirit, or the, 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 the showing of the Holy Spirit, is given to each one to profit who? All. Profit who? All. all. Okay, so let me ask you a question before we even get going here. If the Spirit of God is there and the gifts are moving, will all profit? Yes. That's what it says. Yes. Let me ask you this. If the gifts aren't there, never talked about, never discussed, and never allowed to move, are people missing out on something? Yes. Absolutely. That's what that infers. It absolutely means that. So we should welcome the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We should welcome them. We should be excited. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, says earnestly desire spiritual gifts. It goes on to say, 
He says, for to one is given a word of wisdom through, another, through the Spirit, and to another word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, it's plural, by the same Spirit. Look at this next part. It says, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another diversity of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But one in the same Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit, works all these things, distributing each one individually as what? As he wills. It's as he desires them to work and operate in your life. Now I know there are people that will interpret that and here's what they'll say. Well that means you have one gift and you have another. Okay, hold up. Did we dissect the Holy Spirit or do you have all of the Holy Spirit? Okay, so where are these gifts residing right now currently? Come on, in you. The Holy Spirit didn't say, well when I entered this person, I'm keeping those gifts out. You actually have all the gifts on the inside of you. Uh, years ago, we used, to do a, uh, we used to do a church picnic when the church was small. My sister is sitting up on the front row, probably remember this. So we, back, back when the church was small, we would, do, we would meet out at Mr. and Mrs. Lance's place. It was called Lance Pit. Anybody remember that place? All right, so it was a great place. We used to do church picnic out there. It was awesome, loved it. Still miss it to this day. We'd shut the whole church down, all 50 of us, praise God. We'd go out there, all right? And it grew beyond that, but we did it like five or six years in a row. Anyway, long story short, we get out there and we, did, we would do water baptisms. We would preach and worship. And then at noon, the place would open up to people coming in and it, it was a great time. Bottom line is, uh, my sister brought this young man one time. And now I want to tell you, I was probably 26, 27, 28 years old. I don't know how old I was. I was young, which means I was full of fire, baby. Full of fire. I know some of you think I'm full of fire now. You should have seen me then. I get wound up like a clock. All right? But anyway, so, so uh, she brings this young man in, and he's probably three or four years younger than me, which, you know, when you're young like that, you know, you, you, you think you know everything. Y'all, if you're 25, you don't know what I'm talking about. Because the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. And it's not because I'm forgetting stuff. It's just, wow, there's a whole lot I should have learned a long time ago. All right, anyway, so here we are, and, and we had the service and all that, and, and this guy walks up, and I don't remember exactly the conversation, but it went something like this. A guy walked up to me, and we're sitting across from a picnic table. I don't know if you remember this. And he goes, you believe in tongues? This is his first question. You're, you, you believe in tongues? I said, yeah, yeah, I believe in gifts of the Spirit, because that's tongues is one gift of the nine I don't know why everybody gets caught up on this one. Nobody says, you believe in healing? <laughs> Stupid. I said, yeah. He goes, well, I don't believe in any of that stuff. I go, really? This is not godly. <laughs> I go, really? I go, and I went on. Because at that time, the gift of sarcasm was really thick. All right? And I just went on, all right? And, uh, and finally, I stopped. And he goes, well, what's that? I go, I don't know. You seem to know everything. You tell me what that is. All right? He goes, I don't know. I go, let me tell you what it is. I said, that's a gift of tongues. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. You want to sit here and say you don't believe? I don't care what you believe. It's hard to argue with a man with an experience. Don't tell me about what you do or don't believe. Here's what I do know. And I told him this. I said, here's what I do know. I got saved and I got on fire for God. I never heard anybody speak in tongues ever in my life. Ever. I went into my bedroom. I prayed. And something started flowing out of my mouth. I didn't have that when I was cussing people out. I didn't have that when I was out there. But I got it when I got on fire for Jesus. And it changed my life, praise God. And I'm not ashamed of it either. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? So, 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 so he goes, oh. All right. Now, here's my point. Here's my point. These gifts are there. Now, can I tell you, Michelle hasn't always spoken tongues, and that's okay. It doesn't make anybody more or less spiritual because they operate in gifts or not. As a matter of fact, by the end of my message, I'll bring that crystal clear here in just a little bit. But here's my point. Whenever you begin to talk about these gifts, 
You have to understand that there are three categories of these gifts. There, now, I've never heard anybody teach it like this, but this is the way I see it, and this is the way I categorize them. I think of the mind of God, the hand of God, and the voice of God. The, hand of, or the mind of God is a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discernment of spirits. I'll show you that one here in a minute. A hand of God, faith, healing, and miracles. The voice of God, all right? Diversity of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Now, get this, everybody. It is my opinion that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And these are his gifts. Anybody ever need a word of wisdom in a business meeting? Come on, anybody ever need a, a gift of faith to believe for something? What's amazing to me is you have like that young man I was talking about whenever, you know, I, I, we were in our 20s. We were t he would have no problem going, well, I believe in healing. You believe in healing. So you got a finger of the Holy Spirit, but you didn't take the arm? You start dividing up the Holy Spirit? How many of you know if you are a Christian and you believe that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you got all these? You, the Holy Spirit didn't say, well, ah, keep that one out. And how does it work? Individually, yes, he wills. All right? You say, well, how do I know what he wills? What do you need? Y'all ain't getting it like I got it. You know, in my garage, I got a bunch of tools. What's the best tool? No, no, what's the best tool? How about this? How about this? Everything is not a hammer. Why? Come on, for real, why? Because I don't need a hammer on everything, right? Yesterday, I was putting some screws underneath my dash in my, in my street rod. Be real hard with a hammer, right? I needed a Phillips screwdriver, praise God, right? Now, why? The best tool is the tool you need at the time. What is the best gift? It's the one you need at the time, praise God. And listen, when you know that he lives on the inside of you and these gifts are available, man, I tell you what, greater is he who's in you than he who is in the world, praise God. Greater is he. And whenever we acknowledge it, man, it begins to flow in our life. So I'm gonna give you four things real quick about the gifts. Number one, ready? The gifts are given to everyone for everyone. It's given to everyone for everyone. Everybody has gifts. You may not know it. People have asked, where's the most gifted people on the planet? In the graveyard. In the graveyard. Because a lot of people live their whole lives and never really realize what their giftings are. And it's such a shame. Such a shame. Because God wants you to recognize your giftings. Here's what the Bible says. It says, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. How many of you know you got issues if it's the third hour of the day and you're drinking already? Some of you are like, been there. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> here we go. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. And, and, and now I know we just hear that and we go, oh, that makes sense. But listen to everybody. Up till this point in the Bible, only certain people were anointed to do certain things. You had to be born of a lineage. You had to be born into a tribe. You had to be born of a certain ethnicity. You had to be born of a certain thing for certain things to work in your life. Not anybody could be a priest. You had to be a Levite. Not anybody could be a judge. You had to be from the uh, uh, tribe of Dan. You, not anybody could be a worship. You had to be a tribe of Judah. I mean, you, you were assigned based upon those things. This is a revolutionary statement. He comes along and he says, guess what? Your sons and your daughters... They shall prophesy. Everybody can prophesy. Watch this. It goes on to say these words. You ready? It says, your young men shall see uh, visions and your old men shall dream dreams. I think I'm somewhere in the middle of those. But anyway, and it says, on your men servants and maid servants, I will pour out my spirit. God wants you to know this. And in those days, and they shall prophesy. Notice it says, and they, and they. I've heard people go, I just don't know if I believe in them women preachers. And they shall prophesy. They shall speak forth. I have no problem with women preachers. I have no problem with men preachers. I'd rather hear a good woman preacher than a real bad man preacher. <laughs> Ain't got to help me with that. I know the truth. Praise God. I can't believe Joyce Meyer. She's packing out stadiums. Say what you want. 
You don't know if I can learn nothing. But you'll put your kids in a kids' ministry and expect the ladies to teach them. Ah, see, I didn't even have that planned. That's not even, that's not a slide. All right, I'm moving on. It says, God has given to each one, watch this. He says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Uh -huh. Use them well to serve who? To serve one another. So there's point one. Here's point two. You ready? Every gift of God is unique, important, and necessary. Every gift. Every gift is important. Well, I'll take healing, but I'll stay away from that. I'll take that, but I'll stay away. No, no. No, I'm not saying that maybe you don't operate in a gift, like you've never had it flow through you or anything. That's okay. I'm not mad at that. But bless God, don't be anti-everybody's gift. Right. Y'all ain't getting it. Well, I'm going to show you a great example of it, though. I'm in the military. I'm on fire for God. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm teaching a Bible study every other Friday, Dex's house. It's a great time. People are coming all the time, and I'm excited. I mean, I'm dedicated. I'm hardcore, bloodthirsty. I'm all about Jesus, God squad. <laughs> dedicated. Been on fire for six months. Reading the Bible every day. Dedicated. Pray every morning, every night. Dedicated. Sold out for Jesus. Right? Teaching this Bible study. And it's all good. People are coming. It's all good. People are coming. This lady comes. Her and her husband. His name's Hulo. Still a friend of mine on Facebook. Good guy. Chief Master Sergeant now. Uh, him and his wife come. All right? I didn't have no problem with that. They get saved. I ain't got no problem with that. She saved a day. A day. And she starts prophesying. A day. She starts reading people's mail. You know what the Lord told me? The Lord told me, and the Lord told me, and she's like reading people's mail. She's telling me things that only God and I know. Tell me all this stuff. She prophesied both of my kids being born. She prophesied all kinds of things over my life and over everybody. Anybody that showed up, they were fair game. She was reading their mail. All right? Now, can you believe the audacity? She's been saved a week. I have been dedicated, hardcore, for six months. <laughs> The audacity of God to use this lady to speak these words over these people. I could not believe it. I mean, I've been reading the Bible. She ain't even been saved a week. She shows up, starts telling everybody what's going on in their life, what's happening past, present, and future. And it is money accurate. I'm not talking about these fake, phony basement prophets on Facebook. I'm talking about real legit stuff, y'all. And I'm sitting there, and you would think, you would think I would have it in me to be excited. <laughs> I was mad. I was mad as a hornet, man. I was upset. I'm like, I've been sold out for Jesus. I've been reading the Bible every day. God don't show me nothing about nobody's life. God ain't speaking to me about nobody's life. I just don't understand. I, I, I can't do that. Why does she get all the good stuff? I get the junk. She gets the good stuff. I just teach the Bible. She gets to prophesy. She gets to tell everybody their stuff. I was upset. It took me, I am not exaggerating, I was upset that she got gifted. I was upset. It took me probably a month to get over it. Every time she'd show up at Bible study, I'd go, here we go. <laughs> Everybody's going to word from God. How about we just open the Bible? That's where I flow, all right? All right? The Bible's been here forever. You just got here. <laughs> Y'all ain't good. I had issues. Now watch this. So about a month, month and a half goes on. I build a really close relationship with these guys. And next thing you know, our gift starts operating together. I started flowing in it a little bit. But also, people would come to our Bible study, our life groups, which I would strongly encourage you to get in one. Not the one that I ran. But uh, <laughs> what happened is, she would begin to prophesy, and I would read the Bible, and, and she worked in her gift, and I worked in my gift, and what was happening is our life group just started exploding because people wanted to be ministered to, 
And me, here I am worried about it stepping on my toes when God's like, will you get out of the way? I really want to just bless people and minister to people. And can I tell you, we got on the same page and we started rolling, man, and it was awesome. And even to this day, I still miss being at their base housing, little apartment, having church right there. It was better than the church service, man, because we were rolling and flowing and it was awesome, praise God. Are y'all picking up what I'm putting down? So all I'm trying to say is every gift is unique. It's important and necessary. I was thinking about it like this. What if you took the same thing? Now, there's a, there's a, there's a scripture that talks about gifts in uh, Romans. And I'm just going to read it to you real quick, and I'm going to show you an example. It says, having gift differing according to the grace given to us. These are called the grace gifts, by the way. It says, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If ministry, let us minister. Uh, it says, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts, see, prophecy in teaching going together. He who exhorts in ex exhortation. He who gives with liberty. It says, he who leads with diligence and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. These are also gifts. Now, every one of them works together. So let's just go there. You ready? Name, just real quick here, name a favorite restaurant. Chick-fil-A. I like God's chicken. You can't get better than that. All right, so we got God's chicken, all right, which we'll never get one, Peru or Kogomo, but I'm praying. Uh, so here we go, God's chicken. So let's say, say uh, you know, the waiter is bringing your food, because if you got more than two kids, they'll typically bring your food to you and your table. And they're, they're coming over there, and, and they, you know, uh, may I help you? Um, yeah, thank, thank you, uh, my pleasure. All right, so they're walking to you, they trip and fall and spill your food all over the place. Let's look at just that event and how the different gifts operate, all right? How the different gifts operate. Okay, so here it is. Someone with the preaching gift, all right? Here's what they will say. Well, that's what happens when you're not careful. <laughs> it's the preacher who points out the common sense stuff. Well, that's what happens when you're not careful, yeah? It's like the Apostle Paul. He left John Mark because he was sick. He didn't pray for him. Barnabas prayed for him. Paul's like, I got to keep going. What's wrong with you? Pick it up. Let's go. All right, here we go. You ready? Here's the next one. You ready? If you have the mercy gift, oh, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? How about this one? The serving gift. Oh, I'll help you clean that up. This is the same event. Different people with different giftings responding. The teaching gift. Well, the reason that it fell is because you had too much on your plate. I'm going to explain it all. How about this? Exhortation. Oh, that's okay. That could have happened to anyone. All right, same, same event, different giftings. The giving, oh, here is mine, you're welcome to it. Just give up what you got, all right? How about this, the administration gift, this one's funny to me. You ready? Hey, Jim, you go get a mop. Hey, Bob, you go get the trash can. Hey, Leah, fix another plate for them. Oh, and I need a meeting to make sure that we know why this happened so it never happens again. <laughs> can I get an amen on that? <laughs> We need another meeting. Oh, yeah, great. <laughs> Administrators love meetings. All right? But, but, but the reality is, let me ask you this. Which one of those is right? All of them. All of them. There's not one of those that's wrong. They're just all spoken of from a different place of gifting. Can I get a witness on that? We all need each other. We all need our giftings moving in the same direction so that God gets the most out of each and every one of our lives. So here's number three. Write this one down. God has called all of us to minister with our gifts. You and I have gifts, and we are called to minister from those gifts. I'm going I'm to just leave this right here, and I'm going I'm to say this. Listen to this. One of the terms that I believe with all my heart has done more damage in the body of Christ over the centuries is this term called laity in clergy. You know the word uh, clergy and laity are not in the Bible. They're not. Because it's not a biblical idea. It's not a biblical term. The word clergy literally translates one who reads. Because for centuries, the church as a whole, the people did not have the Bible in their language. So they would have a preacher stand up here and read what the Bible says. I honestly believe a lot of that was about controlling people 
personally. They didn't want the language in the common people's language so that they could control the terms in which the Bible is read. But the reality is this. Clergy means one who reads. I'm not clergy. I'm not one who reads to you. I'm one who teaches you, but I'm not one who just reads. Laity simply means one who lays. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> We've been laying around here doing nothing for a long time. No, I'm just kidding. Listen to this. Laity actually means common people. That's the term. Can I assure you of this? There is no readers and common people. Believe it or not, we're all saints, priests to our God. Matter of fact, the entire Protestant movement was based around the idea in 1517, it was Martin Luther who hung the, the, the 95 thesis, he wrote it, and one of the major parts of that thesis was the priesthood of all believers. He disagreed with the Catholic Church because he believed we are all, listen, we are all kings and priests unto our God. Amen? We're all. That means we're all called to be ministers, to minister with the gift that God has given us. Can I get an amen on that? Listen to this. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in, we should walk in them. Here's the last one. You ready? Last point. Caution, though. Caution. Caution. Gifts are not a sign of maturity. If that was the case, listen to this. The most gifted church in the Bible with the gifts was 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the Corinth church. Do you know there's actually a third Corinthians? Did you know that? There is, what you're reading is actually second and third Corinthians, basically. And the, the, the church history of that is, the Corinth church, when they got Paul's letter, the first one, they tore it up and burn it, because they were so mad at him. Yeah, for real. So that's why he says, I'm writing to you this second time in first Corinthians, all right? Point being, these were a bunch of people that moved in the gifts, but they were absolutely immature. Never mistake spiritual maturity for giftedness. Giftings are just that. They are gifts. They're given to people, and we don't follow gifts. We follow character. We don't follow gifts. There are a lot of gifted people, but here's what happens. Be careful, and I've told this to people before. Your gifting will write a check your character cannot pay for. We do not follow gifting. Now, you should be gifted to lead, but we don't follow gifting. Gifting makes the way, but character is what sustains it. And if you don't believe me, let's just flip it around. If I was out there drinking, sleeping, acting crazy, stealing, doing all this stuff, how many of you know none of you would be here? Oh, come on, say amen to that, praise God, all right? Yeah, you shouldn't be, because if I can't live the gospel, then I shouldn't be preaching the gospel no matter how much gifting I have, right? That's why I've seen it over and over again. You see it, I've seen it. People get going and they get rolling and they get, and then suddenly they're pulled off the rails, and you know what? It all has to do with not gifting 99% of the time. It has nothing to do with their gifting. It has everything to do with their character. You say, so what is the balance of gifting versus character? It has to do with the gifts versus what we call the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what? Self-control. Hello, Will Smith. But against such there is... <laughs> Someone's like, what'd he say? <laughs> against such there is no what? Law. All right? Whenever you break these gifts or these fruits down, here's what you'll find. They can be broken into three categories. Our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with others. When it comes to our relationship with God, it's about love, joy, and peace. That's what he brings us. That's what we have. When it comes to our relationship with ourselves, it is about long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. When it comes to our relationship with others, it's about faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we're to respond. So, let me put it in a category like this, and this is an awesome, awesome picture of the way this is supposed to work. Now, didn't I tell you just a second ago that Martin Luther believed in what is called the priesthood of all believers? How many of you know that you are a priest and a kings and priests unto our God? Okay, you're partly cloudy on that, but I'm going to say it again. You are kings and priests unto God. 
okay? In the Old Testament, the priestly garment was wore by the high priest. And on that high priest, it was made in a specific way to bring balance to exactly what I'm speaking about. So here it is. It says, and upon the hem, you shall make a pomegranate of blue, purple, and scarlet, which blue is the sky, purple, scarlet is the ground, purple is the two coming together. It talks, that's the, the blood of Jesus bringing it all together. It says, all around the hem and the bells of gold between them, all around, gold represents uh, God, and it represents the gifts of God. Now watch this. Here we go. It says, a golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe all around. So notice this. It's a bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate, bell, pomegranate. The bell represents the gifts of the Spirit working in your life. The pomegranate represents the fruit. All right? You need the fruit and the bell working together. Because only then does it have the proper sound of what it's supposed to sound like. The Apostle Paul points this out in 1 Corinthians, and he says it this way. Listen to this, and you probably never heard it this way, but here's what it says. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels. How many of you know that's gift? That's the bell. You know, everybody looks at the bell. Everybody sees the bell. Everybody sees the gift, right? But look, listen to the next part. But if I have not love, what's that? That's the fruit. That's the pomegranate. You need the gift and the, and the fruit working together to make the right sound. It says, if I have one without the other, what? I become a sounding brass and a clinging cymbal. Nobody cares about your gifts slapping each other. What we care about is we want the fruit and we want the gift working in operation in your life. Come on, amen? Amen. That's the way it's supposed to work. You have the fruits and the gifts. Because I've heard people get out of balance with one or the other. I've heard people say, I don't care anything about the gifts. I just want the fruit. That means you have no power in your life. The devil's eating your lunch, popping your bag, and handing it to you. Okay? That's not right. Let's go the other way. I've heard people get so caught up in the gifts that they have no understanding of how to live the gospel. Okay, that's not right either. So where's the balance? The fruits and the gifts operating together in your life. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, so I'm gonna pray for that to happen in your life, all right? Father, I pray for each and every person here, Peru, online, I pray that we would have the fruits and the gifts operating in our life. Father, I believe that each and every person in this room has been given gifts by you, Father, and I believe you want to see them operate in their lives. And now, Lord, I pray that you would bless them, touch them, encourage them, minister to them, have your way. And Father, I pray that they would flow in those gifts and they would allow your fruit to bear fruit in the earth. And Lord, I thank you for blessing them. In Jesus' name, come on, everybody says amen. amen. Will you put your hands together? Give the Lord a clap.